Ideally, any patient who is symptomatic from their parasophageal hernia should be considered for a repair. Symptoms can range anywhere from acid reflux to more obstructive symptoms such as dysphagia or regurgitation. Um, other less common indications for a repair are patients who develop bleeding ulcers, which are called Cameron's ulcers, that occur from where the mucosal folds in the stomach rub against where the diaphragm is pinching. Sliding hiatal hernia is where the gastroesophageal, or GE junction, slides above the diaphragm, but the majority of the stomach remains in its anatomic position below the diaphragm. Most common symptom related to this is reflux. Parasophageal hernias are where the gastric fundus actually goes above the diaphragm. And in really large ones, you can also have other organs that go above the diaphragm as well. Parasophageal hernias are more likely to have obstructive symptoms such as dysphagia or regurgitation associated with them. So around the early 2000s, there was a paradigm shift from open repair to minimally invasive repair of parasophageal hernias. And with that became uh, several adjunct techniques that we use to enhance patients' outcomes. So during the laparoscopic or robotic repair, we're able to see higher into the mediastinum and dissect around the esophagus more to offload the axial tension, reduce it nicely into the abdomen, and reduce recurrence rates. Uh, in the operation, there's several adjuncts that we've added as well to enhance the patient's recovery. So. The first one is if we get into the uh, situation where the esophagus is foreshortened and it can't adequately come down into the, uh, into the abdominal compartment, the esophagus can be lengthened and through an esophageal lengthening procedure known as a collis gastroplasty or a wedge fundectomy, we can offload that axial tension and make it rest inside of the abdomen much more comfortably. Another thing that we're commonly doing is placing absorbable mesh over the diaphragm repair and using that as reinforcement to reduce at least short-term outcomes, but possibly long-term recurrence rates as well. Uh, lastly, we can also perform diaphragm relaxing incisions, where if the diaphragm repair has an undue amount of uh, radial tension on the stitches, we can create a relaxing incision on the diaphragm to make it come together nicer. So we've gotten really good at fixing the patient's acute issues, uh, obstructive symptoms, reflux, uh, bleeding, but the main problem uh, involving outcomes after this type of parasophageal hernia repair uh, revolves around recurrence rates. And early on, the recurrence rates were up to 50% with the open technique. As we've evolved our technique into the minimally invasive surgical approaches, we've able to drastically reduce that recurrence rate somewhere around the 30% range or in more recent literature, somewhere around the 10% range. Um, in my opinion, it boils down to three major concepts, surgeon training and experience, operative technique, and patient selection. So similar to foregut, uh, similar to colorectal surgery, foregut surgery has in, evolved at its own subspecialty with its own fellowship training. And I think that going to an expert foregut surgeon that does a high volume of these uh, who does the right surgery on the right patient will ultimately enhance the patient's outcomes. Uh, patient characteristics that we know can be modified prior to surgery are similar to abdominal wall hernias, controlling BMI, glucose, smoking, stopping medications that reduce uh, wound healing are all things that we can control preoperatively and making sure we address those is, is just as important. So with the minimally invasive surgical approaches, their recoveries become quite tolerable. Uh, classically, when they were doing the open approaches to fix these, the recovery was painful and tedious, but now the hospital length of stay, the time back to work, the post-operative pain have all been drastically reduced. So I don't want to understate the fact that we're doing major abdominal surgery, we're just doing it through small incisions. 
And so typically the patient can expect to stay in the hospital one to two nights, depending on their ability to swallow. Their diet's modified to liquids for the most part for the first couple of weeks and then progress slowly over time. And we limit their heavy lifting for several weeks post-operatively as well.